Archimedes, Archimedes, Archimedes stage is calling. Are you awake? <laughs> Ready for the last day? It's going to be amazing. Tim Berners-Lee is coming. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Fantastic, isn't it? We, and we have some other really interesting stuff today on this stage. First, we're going to hear something about a guy who is using Foursquare. And he, was, he will tell us something about mobile security. It is Pat Walsh. No, Pat Walsh, sorry. Yeah, that's it, Pat Walsh. Yep. After Pat Walsh, we will learn a little bit about European internet history from a guy called Andrew Wea <laughs> from Spain. Then we're going to switch over to the main stage at 12. Sir Tim Berners-Lee going to tell us whatever. I'm very excited about it. Then we go back to our Archimedes stage at uh, 2.30. We're going to have someone from Anonymous. Yeah, Anonymous speaking to us at 2.30 here at Archimedes stage. Mm. Then um, we're going to learn something about uh, email security. It's going to be something like a workshop from Jan Leutert. And we're going to have um, a talk from Mickey de Jong about uh, the, again, about uh, networking and the revolution will be unhosted, it's called, which is also a very interesting topic. And the last uh, talk of the day and of the conference at the Archimedes stage will be something about our energy, and it's called the new energy landscape. Um, and a guy called Helma Rennetz will tell us something about it. So it's going to be an exciting day on the last day of Campus Party Europe in Berlin at the Archimedes stage. Hope you enjoyed it so far. And let's start, to start with Pat Walsh talking about mobile security. Okay. Hi. Well, thanks for uh, coming out this morning, guys. I'm sure some of you were at a party last night. Um, it's great to see you here. I'm very happy to, uh, to be here. And I'm talking mainly about consumer app privacy. A um, little bit about who I work for. Um, I'm the director of privacy for the GSM Association. And uh, so you all use mobile phones and that little bit that lets you make calls. It was a group of 15 companies in 1987 that got together and realized that if you went from the UK to Germany, oops, you couldn't make a call. So they got together and decided how can we make this interoperable. That's the organization I work for. It's grown to represent 800 mobile phone operators around the world, and between them, they connect over 6 billion uh, mobile users, so that's quite significant. The area I work in is a, we address a number of consumer confidence and trust issues. So we have a program, for example, that looks at combating the spread of child sexual abuse images online, uh, safeguarding children, and then the one I focus on is we've established a, uh, a, a global mobile privacy initiative with a number of our members and we've been reaching out to the broader internet uh, companies and others to see how we can come together to create a consistent privacy experience for users of mobile devices. So that's a little bit of uh, me, a little bit of the association. I mean for me I've been in this game, I've been a chief privacy officer for 15 years working for fixed telecom companies and 12 years just in the mobile space alone. So why are we here? I think we're here, we've heard in, uh, I think I've heard now on four different sessions, uh, concerns about privacy on mobile devices. Uh, and I think for me, these are the three key drivers of change. Things have to happen, change has to happen in the industry. Uh, we'll talk about what the policymakers are doing in different jurisdictions, what regulators are doing, why it's important from consumers, and how we need to build that back into the way that developers build apps. At the end of the day, Privacy boils down to trust for consumers. And I think some of the headlines I'm going to show you uh, is quite frightening, really. I mean, I've been looking at, at privacy certainly for the past three years. So I think Barbara talked about um, PATH, and you've heard other people talk about PATH, which was a social networking app which downloaded people's contact details. Well, actually, uh, it didn't happen just with PATH. It happened close to three years ago. There was a company called Dragon Dictate, that had five stars on the uh, Apple app system. It was a brilliant app. And that was uh, speech-to-text conversion. It was absolutely brilliant. 
But what it did, it decided to enhance the app and make it easier for users. So when you want to say send an email to Yanis, it thought, well, do you really want to type that in? It would be much easier if I could just access the contact book. And it finds Yanis's details, sends the email to him. And so there was nothing nefarious. But they announced the app overnight, gave it access through the API to the contact details, sucked up the contact details, sent them to the servers overseas, and there was absolute, utter um, concern and anxiety and distress expressed by those users. And within an hour, more or less, it had gone from five stars on the App Store to one. And the CEO had to issue a public apology. Just as it happened with Path, just as it happens with others. So, you know, reputation is really important. This uh, headline here is about the Wall Street Journal did an investigation into uh, about the top 100 apps and found again that they were accessing a range of data that consumers simply didn't expect an app would access. And that could be, for example, it found that passwords were being sent in clear text. Why would an app send a password in clear text? I mean, people might do it in the e email days, but you certainly wouldn't do it in an app. It was taking location without people knowing. So how many of you used a, do you use a flashlight app on your phones? Yeah? Do you think it's cool for it to take your location? Is there any reason why it needs to take your location? No? Well, there was a guy in the US, he was tested. That there's some research being done in the US where a company called Create With Context had done some brilliant research into how consumers react and feel about privacy. And they, were, they took them through how they use the mobile phones, then they showed them the privacy policies, and there was, <gasps> you mean the apps? And then this one guy from California said, well, actually, yeah, I, I, I can see why my location data would be needed, because if I'm lost in the desert and I switch on my battery flashlight app, the emergency services will be able to find me straight away. But, um, but you know, that, that's an aside. Um, so even big companies are becoming aware. I mean, this was a rim, this was a bull billboard in the middle of London that privacy is something everybody should know about. That was rim. I was here the other night and Google have a hackathon on privacy for Chrome extensions. Uh, and this is about creating, enhancing transparency for users, but giving them better choice and better control. And ultimately, uh, that's what this is about. The other uh, article on the how much privacy can smartphone, is, uh, smartphone owners expect, this is about concerns over where technology is going. So the other day, for example, you may have seen headlines about a group of companies that formed a, a, a small group to create an indoor location uh, service, if you like. So if I look two years down the road, I can see where handsets will be sensor enabled. They'll be talking to sensors in urban environments. So as I'm walking along here, for example, it will know where I am inside, in addition to the wireless line and the GPS coordinates. So it's going to be very, very precise. And that's what some of these headlines are about. And it's some of these headlines that are driving concern. But as I said, it's not about anything nefarious at all. It's about the fact that people are simply, that there isn't sufficient transparency and opportunity for choice and control. Why have I put this one up here? Well, over the past two years, there's been a number of services launched online to educate people in privacy. One was called pleaserobme.com. Has anybody heard of that? Yeah? And you'll know, well, this is very similar. So this is weknowyourhouse.com. And this is about the fact that many people tweet and forget that they've geo-enabled those tweets. And the, you know, you can use, very simple, you could use EFX Viewer, for example, to determine where the house is. Uh, what they've done here, this data stays up for an hour. Uh, I decided not to put one up from yesterday, uh, where it gives you a screenshot of the house, and it obscures part of the, the house address details, but in my view, not sufficient to protect the privacy of that individual because I could quite easily, probably within one minute, find where that, that tweet was sent from on the information that's available in here. But, um, but what I like about this one here is this chap who's saying that at every party there are two kinds of people, those who want to go home and those who want to stay. The trouble is they're usually married to each other. I think that, make, you know, that makes my day.
But um, here's another one. So what are your apps doing? This is more research, again, about the fact that apps are simply accessing a range of data, simply because apps can access that data. How many of you developers? How many develop apps? I mean, do, do, you, actually, do you think about privacy when you're developing an app? You do? No. <laughs> That's just it, isn't it? Um, I think there is this growing awareness that perhaps people should be thinking. Uh, I was at a conference recently and, and one of the developers of Facebook said just because you've got, you can get access to data doesn't mean that you should be accessing the data. <clears throat> and what this is about, again, is that increasingly people are simply concerned and we'll show some of the research we've done, which is on the front here, how it's inhibiting, it's acting as a barrier to engagement. If people don't engage with your apps, then you don't sell. If, you, if they're not engaging with your apps, they're not aware of the in-app advertising, are they? They're not going to interact with the uh, in-app advertising that you're earning money from if they can't trust you. Uh, again, this is just more research that shows that 97% of people simply don't understand what's being asked of them. I was going to put some screenshots up of Android privacy permissions, but I decided not to. But I mean, how many of you program for Android? Okay, do you think that users can understand those permissions? I can't. I mean, phone state, what does phone state mean to the average user? Why word an app? Uh, there was one I downloaded for my young boy the other day, a football app. It wanted to read the phone state. It wanted to know the mobile number of the device. It wanted and could access the call data. What, why would a football app ever need that? Why should a football app have access to that data? It simply shouldn't have access to that data. And this is where some of the concern is coming from. It's these concerns and this lack of transparency, this lack of opportunity to express choice and control over that, where it's not necessary, that is driving calls for some policymakers to regulate. So yesterday, some of you will have seen Neely Cruz. You saw all see Neely Cruz, Commissioner Neely Cruz. Okay, well, she has a very important job in Europe. She's responsible not only for the digital agenda, but in Europe we have two directives that regulate data protection and privacy in Europe. And Neely Cruz is responsible for an e-privacy directive. So how many of you are aware of cookie, rules about cookies? Yeah, well she's responsible for that law. And the other commissioner is Commissioner Vivian Redding. She's, just, she's the commissioner responsible for justice and human rights and the main data protection directive. So she was she expressed these views because Channel 4 in the UK did an investigation like the Wall Street Journal and like some of those other headlines that I've shown uh, into apps and she was horrified by what she found and so it's on the it's on the policymakers agenda and in Europe for example they're planning on introducing new laws in a couple of years some of those new laws and, and this will fit into something I'll talk about later on privacy by design is going to include, they're extending definitions of personal data. So the law will cover things like, the main law will cover things like location data, whereas only the e-privacy directive currently regulates that. And it's going to require you to get express opt-in consent for a range of things. And what it's going to do, it's going to uh, fine companies up to 2% of their global worldwide turnover if they fail to give you this information, if they fail to get consent when consent is necessary. So if a company is going to be fined that much, what do you think they're going to do? Do you think they're going to give you less information or more information? I think they're going to give you more information. And I think they're going to make you make more decisions. And I think that's bad for privacy because the more decisions you have to make and you, the more you're asked to say, yes, opt into this, I think the more you're likely to say, just to get rid of that. Because people buy phones to have fun. They don't buy phones to be bored to death with privacy, do they? I don't, anyway. So. Some of the work that we're doing, and I'll talk about later, is how can we make this easier? How can developers, for example, create sufficient awareness, give people choice when it matters? And I'll talk about why, uh, how we're getting it wrong at the moment. This is the US, so I'm also involved in discussions in the US with the US government and with the California Attorney General's Office who are looking at developing guidelines and introducing rules on uh, mobile privacy. The Japanese government uh, two days ago announced that it's going to issue guidelines on app privacy in addition to other countries. So around the world, policymakers and regulators are so concerned they're thinking about introducing laws unless the industry
can build privacy in and demonstrate that it's really giving people choice. So this is about, um, I was at the meeting in July, the first meeting on this. They're going to introduce a code of conduct which is legally enforceable by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission in the US, for um, American companies, of course. Um, and let's not forget that the majority of the, the companies that provide uh, the OS and provide the apps are based in America, so it's a huge concern to them. This is a congressman, Hank Johnson, who's just uh, launched an app privacy rights initiative. And his key word here that I've circled is, our app should serve us, not spy on us. That's how bad the reputation is of apps. It's considered that they're doing something nefarious, that they're secretly and purposely accessing data for no good reason. Uh, and so um, this is attracting a lot of attention in the US at the moment. The Norwegian regulator, this was done two years ago investigated mainly uh, a lot of foreign apps, a couple of European apps, a lot of foreign apps, and they're about to start their second phase of this. Uh, and this was about the fact that, again, people just weren't being made aware of what apps, they weren't being given choices. Actually, it wasn't uncomplying with the law, never mind what consumers want. I don't think this should be about the law. I actually think it should be about engendering trust. It should be about giving people real choice uh, on their devices. And you'll notice there's a, something I put there in the, in the squares, the parenthesis, which is UDIDs. I think a lot of you as app developers, you like to use the, the unique device identifier, don't you? Do you like to track across apps? I mean, do, you know, particularly if you're into, um, if you've got multiple apps and you want to understand your user behavior from that device, what works, and that's legitimate, isn't it? You want to know what works, what doesn't want to work. You don't want to invest time and money in something that nobody's going to use. If, if, you, if your app is supported by advertising, because it's free, and there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? If it's free, you've got to understand whether that's being effective or not. Well, there's such concern over the, the uh, unique device identifiers as well. Again, this is, this is um, the director of the FTC in the US who's looking at and saying again. So there's a theme coming in here, isn't it? What everybody's saying is it has to be simpler. Simple, simple, simple. But it's not that easy, is it? And I had some interesting conversations the other day. Somebody said, well, do people really care? If people cared, they wouldn't be using all these other social networking services. They'd simply ditch them. Uh, well, when people say that to me, actually they fail to understand that on that big social network they're usually referring to, that a lot of young people deactivate their accounts every night and reactivate them in the morning so that there's no trail maintained. So people can't continue to track. So, so we did some research, and it's on the front here. Um, we conducted research amongst 4,000 people in Singapore and in Spain and in the UK. And overwhelmingly, 92% of people are actually concerned uh, about applications accessing their data without their consent. And that's really, really important because this boils down to trust. And a number of people also said that they would actually limit what apps could do if they had the choice because there's an erosion of trust. I think I'm, I was on the stage yesterday and I mentioned that, you know, it is about trust. Somebody asked me whether I let people track me online. I do. I let Amazon understand what I do when I'm in Amazon because I like the fact that Amazon tell me that there's a CD, a book or something else that I've missed. I love it. Why do I allow them to do it? Because I trust them. But actually in my browser, I have a number of extensions that I use to prevent other websites from tracking me and other services from tracking me. Why? Because I haven't established a relationship of trust. They haven't explained to me the exchange value. They haven't exchanged to me, explained to me the benefit of me giving up some of my privacy in exchange for their free services. And I think that's a challenge that we all, we all face. How do we do that? And I think here, what I find interesting in this stat is that whilst there's concern, 70% of people actually value location-based advertising, they value location-based services, but they still want to be able to switch things on and off. So how easy is that within your apps? I mean, the app developers at the moment, how easy is it in context to switch things on and off? And what do I mean? Okay, I've got a smartphone here, I'm not gonna wave the logo, uh, but the only, app on there really that's native and shipped with that device 
I mean, the company that ships that device is very proud of the fact that it has an indicator, a geolocation indicator. So when I'm using an app that is geo-enabled, it has a little indicator. And it's one color when it's live. And if I go into my settings and it's gray, I can say, oh, yeah, that app's accessed my data in the past 24 hours. But one of the main apps on there doesn't actually do that. That's the camera app. So here's a scenario that you know, makes me want to use another app. So I took a photo of some hi-fi gear I wanted to sell on eBay. I'd forgotten that I had the camera app geo-enabled because I hadn't used it for about a month, which is rare, but I hadn't used it. I took a photograph, put the image online, and then I thought, sugar. And I remembered that the app had been geo-enabled. So I used EFX Viewer, and there was a map and a satellite photo of my house. What did that say to somebody? It said, hey, you're selling some gear, you could steal it. And in two weeks' time, you'll probably have some new gear. We can go back and steal that too. So I had to go back online, take it off, strip it out. Uh, actually, that's not what I want. So what I want in that context, and I'll talk about context in a moment, but context is king here. You cannot deal with privacy by giving somebody a long, lengthy privacy policy. Those days are over, those days are gone. They have their role because legally companies have to tell you all these things. Otherwise, they get fined and they get prosecuted and the regulators are not happy. But actually, from a consumer experience, it sucks, doesn't it? Privacy policies actually suck. So in that context, what I wanted, I'd have preferred that the company that provides that app and that service to me says, I could, why can't I set my preferences to say that if I haven't used this app in five days, remind me that Geo is on. I mean, there's a great uh, group of academics in the UK. Uh, they have a project called Prima, Privacy Rights Management in Mobile Applications. It's run by the Imperial College and the Open University. Uh, and they are looking at how the app can learn from your behavior and automatically set your privacy settings. So, for example, it would look at um, what's the context when you reject a call? I mean, and it will learn from that and help determine whether the call should be rejected in the next context. Um, I wouldn't want my wife to find those things out when I'm rejecting when she's calling, but you know, it has great potential. They've got another, um, they've got a Hanaptic uh, app that helps you set your privacy settings, your location privacy settings, simply by shaking your phone. So, okay, 57% of people think that we should be, uh, there should be consistent rules in privacy. Actually, I think that's quite a significant thing because the only thing that's consistent in the secret system is the lack of consistency in approach to privacy. It's true. Hey guys, and guess what? If you're app developers, 48% of those that we surveyed said that they would hold you responsible. That's after us, by the way. Even though we don't supply the app, mobile operators, they'd, they'd still hold the mobile operator <laughs> responsible. One of the reasons we're engaged in this. Okay, it's complex. I don't know if you can see this or not. But this was the top five countries of one app uh, company, uh, Million Apps, uh, and the apps, the top five countries were the US, United Kingdom, India, Netherlands, and Spain. Top five cities were New York, London, Los Angeles, Bangalore, and Riyadh. Now, the reason I've got this up here, I can actually walk around, can't I? Is that, um, if I look at it, is that one of the problems we've got at the moment is that, you know, when we talk about pri privacy laws, uh, you know, people's privacy, the apps are global, aren't they? I'm here in Berlin, I download an app from a US store. The app developer could, could be in Nairobi. The app's free, so he's done a deal with Flurry in the US. There's another company then that is part of that trail that is delivering advertising to me. So there's one game, one of the world's most popular games, involves about seven different entities sharing that data in order to profile and target me with advertising. So, although this is global, although these data flows are immediate and they're global in nature, they cross borders instantaneously, privacy is subject to a global patchwork of local or national laws. It simply doesn't work. What law as a developer are you going to comply with? I mean, as a developer, do you want some consistent guidelines to help you to say, well, I only have to build it once. I don't have to build it 20 different times. Because when we talk to developers, that's what they say to us. Help us get things to market more quickly because it's time and money. I have mortgages to pay, electricity bills to pay. And, but I think this is quite fascinating because it shows you 
how challenging it is with apps and data flowing across the world. But this is quite interesting, isn't it? Because when we think about a person with a mobile phone, in the old days it was just you and your mobile phone operator. That was it. But actually, with your smartphone and the mobile internet, you're actually enmeshed. I like to, Yanis knows what I'm going to say. You're, you're enmeshed in a global web of complex relationships, aren't you? A complex web with all of these entities. When you use one app, it can involve a, mo a, a number of these different entities accessing and sharing your data. So what does that mean? Does that mean that you should have five, six, seven privacy notices? Five, six, seven consent notices that you have to have? I mean, as a developer, what does that mean for you? That's more complexity, isn't it? It's more cost. And actually, it disengages consumers. Consumers are simply not interested in that because they just switch off. So they'll go to an app over here that's done it differently and better. And we're talking to policymakers and regulators about this complexity, about the need to think differently. But also, I think what it's going to need is for industry to uh, come together. So, I think you heard, I don't know if Hugo's here, Hugo Roy, uh, in terms of service, DE, he was speaking on the stage of the day about terms of service. And the reason privacy policies suck is because it's so difficult on mobile phones. I mean, it's difficult enough on a laptop or a desktop, isn't it? But on a mobile phone, essentially, they just don't work. Your comprehension levels are so small. And you know, when you get this little advertising icon, you ever seen it on your mobile? You've got a little advertising icon? Well, let's think about design here, because the advertising icon that is being used to signal to people that there's ad involved in here, you need to click to make choices. It's been designed for the precision of a, of a user-driven mouse interaction. It has not been designed for fat fingers and fat thumbs on a small screen of a touch, uh, of a touch screen of a, of a smartphone. So when you go and try and click for that information, you accidentally click the banner ad. So 47% of people that go and look for the information about the ad, click the ad because they, can't, because they can't get to it. So we need to think differently about designing to help people. Now, why have I got 23963 out there? Anybody got a guess what 23963 means? No, okay, it's too early in the morning. Well, that, recently I had to agree to new terms and conditions on my phone. Two sets. One was in relation to the OS and the music software and the little app bits. The privacy policy, uh, the safe harbor agreement, because it's an American company, and the cookie notices. It amounted to 23,963. When I started reading that, I was Auburn. By the time I got to the end of that privacy policy, this is the color. I was. It took that long to read it and I struggled to read it. But also, a few weeks later, I also had to agree some other new terms and conditions for their cloud services that amounted to 16 and a half thousand words. Add those up together, it's quite a fat novel, isn't it, really? It simply doesn't work. We have to find different ways. And this is the uh, Hugo Roy the other day was talking about um, terms of service, didn't read them. Um, this links into, there was a, an organization, EFF started Tossback, so got a Tossback.org. Uh, they're just about to relaunch that again, where they're reviewing the uh, privacy policies of websites and categorizing them, good, bad, transparent. Uh, there's another company that you should really check out is Privacy Choice. Go to Privacy Choice, it's run by a guy called Jim Brock. Uh, he's a fab guy, a really, really fab guy, doing some fantastic work. I've got a couple of slides up at the moment. But I have read and agreed to the terms. It's the biggest lie on the web. It is, because when we did our research, and please go online and look for our research, you'll see there the reason that people click and go through is because they can't understand them. They're so long. They're 23,693 words long. Who on earth has... Do you have time to read those things? I don't have time to read those things. I mean, you know, I'll be getting my pension before I read the end of that one, I think. So what are we doing about it? Well. We have a pro mobile privacy initiative. <gasps> I better hurry up. Uh, we've been working with our members. We've been reaching out to other people in the industry about this fact that there aren't any consistent guidelines to help developers develop in a way that considers privacy. Um, so we publish a set of principles. Why do we publish principles? Do you remember that map where I showed you where, you know, if we remember the, the app stores in the US, the app developers in Nairobi, the analytics companies in the US or Australia, data's flowing everywhere, and there's a patchwork of laws. So what we had members who operate in countries with no laws at all. 
but where they're finding that consumers are concerned about their privacy. They said to us, well, what do we do about this? There are, there's no gardens. So we looked at all the key uh, legal frameworks around the world and came up with a core set of principles that's common throughout them. And that's very important. So we have members in different countries who are implementing these principles. But we said, well, principles are not enough. So we've developed some and published some um, privacy design guidelines for mobile app development. They're on some of the chairs there. And we're also, we've held workshops looking at the role of privacy nudges and icons. Because you can't have that 23,000 word privacy policy. The terms of service, which Hugo is doing, fantastic. But how do we get that on a mobile? How do we signal, what, what is a consistent icon? I mean, if you look at GPS alone, there are, or location, there are three different icons that I could think used by two of the top OS and uh, handset manufacturers. So these are the principles. It says that you know, you've got to be open with people. You've got to be transparent about what you're doing. What's wrong with that? You've got to give them notice. Give them choice. Tell them, why do you want the data? Who are you? How many of you actually publish details, uh, meaningful details, where they can contact you and get hold of you? If you've got a, oh, email is here. If you've got a problem with this app service and somebody's running that for you, are they aware of what they should do? Are they aware of what they should say to people? Uh, people have rights in relation to their, to their privacy. Security. How many of you transmit UDIDs and passwords in open text? Shouldn't be done. Should keep data secure. When you're securing, when you've got holding data overseas or on a server somewhere, is that server, is that database secure? Education. If you built privacy options into your products, are you making people aware that they exist? Can they find it easily? Can they access those tools easily? Children and adolescents. If you are targeting kids and adolescents, is the language right for that target audience? Um, there's an icon coming up, I know I've only got a few minutes, an icon coming up uh, where there's a group of developers called Moms with Apps in the US. They are fantastic. Uh, Lorraine Aitken is the person that runs it and they've come up with a set of icons for kids' apps that simply tells the parent very quickly whether, whether that um, app is ad-supported, whether it's got in-app purchases, so you know as, a, as an iPhone user you can go in and switch off your in-app purchase because you don't want that large credit bill. Um, so there's great work being done. And then we've got the guidelines. I would urge you to have a look at these. We've been told that they are uh, quite good. In fact, this is some of the uh, feedback we've had. Even the BBC were covering it. So who do we have at the moment implementing these? We've got Telenor. You know, Telenor, I was out in Malaysia with the uh, companies recently uh, talking about these guidelines, uh, how they might be implemented in different territories where there are no laws. We've got Deutsche Telekom here in Germany are implementing them. Uh, Vodafone, Telecom Austria, Telesonaria, Telefonica uh, are engaged in this process. I think it's fantastic. And this is what I like. Some of the coverage we got was saying that there's some brilliant recommendations to develop industry-wide uh, stuff. And this, for example, we talked about the California Attorney General. Now, Kamala Harris brought together uh, Amazon, Google, Microsoft and others to say, guys, uh, we need some best practice here. So they all agreed to establish best practice. We were invited to be part of that process because the California Attorney General's office likes these. A lot of the work is based on these. And this is a letter from Facebook recently, who recently joined that initiative. The reason I put this up here is because it's quite important because the things that they're agreeing to are in these guidelines and have been in these guidelines for about 18 months. So it's nice to know that we were right. So, privacy choice. If you're an app developer, please do visit it because it's an easy way for you to begin to generate your privacy policies and icons, for example. Um, it's so easy to use and, and they want your feedback. So on privacy choice, it's got a range of icons here it tells people what they do and if you look at the bottom right uh, they're using an icon from the Moms with Apps team they've already integrated it into their program they're so quick and responsive and like um, the terms of service uh, run by Hugo Privacy Choice also have a service where they scan websites and they're scoring them so it's quite interesting if you go into that website and look at how they're scoring some of the top top companies so what do you want? I mean what do we need here? We need human readable don't we? but it needs to be simple and easy I put a smile on face, it has to be lawyer acceptable because if you work for big companies, the lawyers always want to say this, but if you leave it to the lawyers, no one's going to understand it. I know that because I used to work for general counsels, I'm not a lawyer, but I used to work for general counsels and try and get this stuff written in non-legalese. It has to be mach re machine readable globally, doesn't it? But it has to be contextually relevant. So how do you give somebody notice when it matters? 
not when you think it matters, when it matters to them. How do we help people make a decision in context? Because that is really, really the key here. You can't do this with that 23,693 privacy policy. Now, something really interesting, guys. You've built models, haven't you? And I'm aware I've probably got about four minutes left. You've built models, business models, premised on accessing and getting data and using data. Because let's face it, what we've all become as smartphone users, we've become broadcasters of data, haven't we? Automatically, our devices broadcast data. This data you need to support your app, very important to you. Well, this guy that's developed this, Ashkan Sultani, do you remember I, one of the first slides I showed from the Wall, Wall Street Journal investigation? Ashkan was the ex-FTC technologist who worked for the Wall Street Journal after he left the FTC, who did the uh, computer investigations into apps. He, along with two other people, have developed this product called MobileScope. MobileScope is intended not only to make people aware of what uh, data is being exfiltrated from a device, but it's also designed to stop the exfiltration of that device. So actually, you could say that the failure in policy making, the failure of business, is leading to innovation in privacy tools. It really is. But what's the impact on your business? What's the impact on your app? If I, get, if I download something, stop you getting that data, what does that mean for you? Um, again, this is um, an app quality Assure, uh, alliance. Uh, they've now issued best practices. It's some of the big companies. So Nokia and Orange, for example, it's a TLG, are starting to, um, are starting to, to test apps for quality. Um, and don't forget that you can. We'd like to get your views, your feedback. We've been walking around, we've been talking to people. But what we're telling policymakers and regulators is actually it's not really us, it's the guys that design these things you need to be talking to in addition to the users of these apps. So we've got a survey online, we're very grateful if you could take five minutes and fill it in. You can win a Samsung Galaxy S3. I think it's Olympic branded, isn't it, Yanis? There you go. A piece of history in the making. Well, think of all those goals we won. It's wonderful. Um, if you can fill that in, that would be absolutely fantastic. Uh, that's our website. There's a range of information there. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, we are engaged in this debate. I'm back here in Berlin on Monday. The German government have invited us to come and talk uh, in more detail about this issue of context, about how the impact of privacy notices really isn't, you know, or the impact of prescribing privacy notices and excessive consent. And then, am I on time? That's about it. So, it's over to you guys, really. Throw anything at us. Not literally, of course. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very interesting. It's, um, are we still... Can we get it solved somehow? Yes, we can. I have the impression that um, every second it gets more complicated. No, I, I, and I think, just to go back to what I said at the beginning, there's not, it's not that there's anything nefarious going on here. It's that people often don't think that privacy actually matters. An assumption that privacy doesn't matter to people, but actually, it's hugely important. People do switch off. And it has, you know, if you're a company, as we've seen from CEOs having to make public apologies, we've seen their share prices slide as a result. I forgot to say, there's a, a slide I wanted to put up here. There's a company in, in, in the US, the most positive slide I've seen is hiring over 120 people. It develops a privacy app. Privacy is good. It doesn't have to be bad. It doesn't have to be a barrier. No, no, no. Of course not. Not. Thank you very much. Anyone have a question? Our volunteer. Hey, can you please? Stay? Um. So I recently heard about an app called, I think it was AppGuard, and it, it's an Android app that runs in the background. Um, it's a little bit like Little Snitch on the Mac. Right. Yeah. So it um, monitors connections to the outside. Um, and I think it also got blocked by Google recently, but I'm not sure about that. Um, do you think um, it's a good idea to try to handle this on a, in a technical way? Or do you think it's better to um, to do global poli uh, political things about it? 
Uh, it needs a combination for me. Uh, I think we have to find some technical solutions, a little bit like uh, Ashkan Sultani, Mobile Scott, there are others that I could have put up, but I only had one hour. There are lots of people looking technically how you could analyze an app on the fly, even, uh, and determine whether that's a legitimate app, whether it's a malicious app, uh, whether it's trying to do something it shouldn't be doing in, a, in, in relation to the policy permissions. So it's about defining the policy permissions at a technical level, ensuring that the app is doing what it says on the tin, but I think at a policy level, it's really important that we don't, uh, the policymakers don't over-regulate here. Uh, law cannot deal with this at all. And I don't want policymakers to determine what my privacy interests should be. I mean, I have privacy interests, their expectations, their needs, their wants. A, a, a regulator, a lawyer, a, you know, a, 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 an MP can't decide that for me. But I will go to the company that meets my privacy interests, that has uh, a camera app, that allows me to set my privacy preferences in terms of location. So I think the market will also do this, but I think it needs industry to come together. I mean, I've seen some uh, signs of that. I think this California Attorney General's Office uh, initiative and the US initiative is bringing those big players together at last, uh, because that's long overdue in my, uh, in my opinion, yeah. Any more questions? I knew it. <laughs> you, you mentioned that you don't believe um, regulation is the way to go about things. Is there not an argument that it might be necessary, though? Because the, the best example I can give is if you make this a voluntary code or best practice, it hasn't history taught us not everyone will take this up. A lot of people will ignore or abuse it. Is there not some place for some form of regulation? Well, that, that's an excellent point, and I think the ad industry is a good case in point, that there's a recognition that there has to be a framework of accountability. People have to be accountable. If you make a promise, and that promise isn't a code, that's what the code is, you have to be accountable to that. So uh, that's why in the US it's going to be legally enforceable. I think uh, I talked about the new European regulations coming in, possibly 2014. I think they hope the end of 2013. I think that's a bit ambitious. But in there are three things I love. The three things I like most about those proposals is that it recognizes the concept of privacy by design, but is letting industry decide what that privacy design is, because they need to understand the appropriate technology. It supports codes of conduct, and they will be approved codes of conduct. So that's where the rub is. And it also supports uh, privacy assurance schemes. So I see we're going to have an emergence of privacy assurance schemes here. But then the trick is, do we want all these multiple guidelines? Do you have multiple assurance schemes? And what does it mean for a consumer? Uh, do I go for A, B, or C? Who do I trust the most? And I think that's some of the challenge we as an industry have to deal with. And I think if you remember the slide about the complex ecosystem, I think the thing that's important about that is that you, me, uh, we are customers of all of those different stakeholders. What what, what is bad, what happens here and is bad in this part of the ecosystem ripples throughout the other side. So I think we all have a collective responsibility to come together. And I hear big companies saying, oh, we need dialogue, we need dialogue. I'd like them, that dialogue, to move to action. So on Google's thing, for example, it's, I think it says, don't just talk, take action. Yes, Google, thank you. I look forward to, <laughs> to, to the action, to, to more dialogue, because that's, what ne that's what's needed, really. I'm not sure if it answered it, uh, but I think um, there does need to be absolute accountability. Um, uh, and that means it has to have framework with enforcement and penalties in it, et cetera, for those that don't comply with those rules. Yeah. One more question here. Do you also work on um, making carriers aware of privacy issues? Because we have seen uh, ca uh, carriers uh, shipping mobile phones with spyware installed or having remote access or for example, in Germany, uh, they use the GSM, GSM encryption, which is uh, known to be broken for over two years. So uh, do you work on uh, making the carriers aware of privacy issues? Well, I, I uh, work for the trade body that represents 800 mobile carriers around the world. So first of all, let's deal with that first one. Uh, I think that was the issue in the US that you're referring to, wasn't it? It was a carrier IQ. Uh, again, that wasn't put there for any nefarious reasons. It's notoriously difficult to keep a handset working properly on a device. I know I've been working for carriers for 12 years. I've had to sit with network engineers, applications, software engineers, everything to try and figure out how you get this device to simply connect to a network. How you get it, because what you guys, you get frustrated if things drop, it doesn't work. 
and that takes a lot of hard work. So you need to understand what's happening with that device in a legitimate way. You need to be able to update that device with software. Um, so for the Car IQ, I didn't see anything nefarious going on in that. Yeah. But the user should be aware of it, don't you agree? Uh, I think, uh, so should you be aware of the fact that, you know, in order to connect to the local cell and they've got a mobile station over here, that the station there needs to know where you are in order to connect? Do you, do you need, really need to be told that? Because that's part of the legitimate business interests of, and, and, and that data isn't being used for anything nefarious at all. So I think we're in danger then of giving you 23,693 words. What we should be doing is telling when it really matters. And in relation to Camera IQ, none of that data was being used for commercial targeting or anything. It was simply to understand and to keep the network, to keep the handset working. And don't forget, it wasn't just carriers. There were device manufacturers that were using that software, not the carriers. So there were only one or two carriers using that software. Um, in relation to the other matter you raised, uh, I'm not the security expert. We do have a director of security that deals with that. Um, I'm not aware of the particular issues here in Germany because I was asked that question yesterday. Uh, but, you know, there are uh, those, those uh, algorithms are updated. Uh, and I think simply there's an expectation that those uh, later standards will be adopted. Thank you very much, Mr. Pat Walls. Any one more, maybe, question? No. Okay. So let's no. go. We're gone. Okay. Don't forget you can win an S3. Fill in that survey. Um, I, my question is pretty simple. If I, have, if I have one bad app on my phone, is my phone completely vulnerable at that point? And if so, why aren't people building sort of virtual machine environments in the phone so that one bad app can't steal the whole phone? That, that's a good question. And I think whether you get a bad app on there depends on which OS uh, you're using. So there's one, well, no, there's one manufacturer would argue that, hey, we're closed and it's not possible, but it's been shown that it was app possible. App well, on, on one app store, there are 650,000. Uh, and they, and, and, and in the last year, uh, that one app store removed 10,000, uh, mainly uh, in the books environment. Uh, but I think that issue you're talking about is more prevalent to, I don't know where they are, but there's, um, a group of developers over there working on something. Um, that's in the open. Um, I think there are more risks in that, in that open environment. But that's where, like Askan Sultani and others, are trying to... Well, yeah, um, there are. For me, there are. But there are... There are uh, that's where Askan Sultani and others are working on that. But I think, you know, that's where it needs the, the chip manufacturer, the device manu uh, manufacturers, the OS coming together. That's why I'm quite excited about the Mozilla Firefox OS. I think there's a real opportunity there to address that issue. There's a real opportunity to build privacy and security in at that kernel. I think you know there's a there's a clean slate they can start with, but I think they need to have that input, don't they? They need to hear those what, what you have to say and others. Really, not the answer you wanted, but I have a wish for an app. What's I that? want I, I want one app which shows me all the privacy issues of the other apps. Talking about transparency. Well, uh, I saw uh, Mobile Scope. I was out in the US recently with Ashcan, and uh, I'm quite excited uh, by what it will do. Um, I think these kind of things are a long time coming. I think because of the question you raised, it's the reason that Ashcan and others are getting involved. Because, you know, if others are not going to do it, then some of these entrepreneurs will do it. And I think uh, they've recognized that privacy, actually, uh, you can make money out of it. Money with privacy. Yeah. Okay, let's close it. Thank you very much, Mr. Walsh. I'm looking forward to more competitions on Foursquare. <laughs> yeah. um, where do you talk on Monday? Is your uh, talk public or...? No, it's at the university, so it's a couple of day workshop next Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, the German government are uh, trying to understand the implications of these proposed uh, EU rules mm -hmm. uh, and what it means for consumer experiences, for example, because we're trying to convince them that consumer experience matters. You can't impose all these things on them but it needs the industry to understand what would what you know what does a contextual notice look like what will the icon look like will the icon be sufficient to transmit information yeah. okay thank you and thanks for the nice handouts and also for the smartphone cleaning thing it's all on, it, it, uh, check your um, chairs and the slides are or all the information is on the nice USB stick thank you for your attention in the morning yes it is an USB stick.
twist it. Can you twist? <laughs> twist. <laughs> yeah. So we make a five a minutes gigabyte. break, and um, I'm very looking forward uh, to see Mr. Andre Weya. Is he already here, Mr. Andrea Weya? Okay. He will be here shortly, and we, he's going to uh, make a talk about the uh, inter European Internet history. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. <laughs>